Big in, we are doing this series called The Practical Atheist, and we're looking at five ways Christians often live as if God doesn't exist. See, the truth is that we often confess theological truths. Christians have long confessed theological truths. We confess <coughs> that God is, that God is eternal, that God is omniscient, all-powerful, um, all-knowing, all-good. We confess these truths, and yet... Often there's a disconnect between what I say I believe and what I may even believe and how I actually live my life. And so we're looking at several of those things. Uh, we see, as we have gone through this series, uh, the question, would your weekly experience look different if you didn't believe in God anymore? In other words, uh, if God was no longer a factor in your week, how much would your week change? And what that reveals is... How much of our lives are built around our faith and how much actually we do without any thought of how God plays a part in what it is we're doing. And we saw that this has biblical precedent. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13, then the Lord said, because the people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of traditions learned by rote. In other words, he's going, you're not doing the things you're doing because you love me and because you're dependent upon me. You're doing the things you're doing because you've just always done them. And if God was no longer a factor, how much would your week change? The last time we were together, the first time we were together, we looked at the issue of prayerlessness. And we saw that prayerlessness is practical atheism. Prayerlessness is practical atheism. Why? Because it acts as if uh, I don't need God for the things I don't pray for. Everything I don't pray for declares I don't need God for this. I, I typically pray for the things that I think I don't need, or that I need God for. But then if I don't pray, what does that say? Everything I don't pray for declares I don't need God for. Then the last time we were together, we looked at secret sin. Secret sin is practical atheism. Why? Because it acts as if God doesn't see, know, or care. Secret sin acts as if God doesn't see, know, or care. And as we come to our third uh, uh, talk today, our third message, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. And as we begin, I want to make a statement. There are few things as scary in life as that which might happen. There are a few things as scary in life as that which might happen. Now, the things that I know are going to happen, I can begin to prepare for, but it's the things that might happen that I don't know how to best prepare for, and those are the things that can often be devastating. After all, I mean, granted, many of the things we worry about never actually happen. There was a bassoon player one time who came up to his conductor and nervously said that he could not reach the high E flat, and he was greatly troubled by this. The conductor just smiled and said, don't worry, there's no E-flat in your music tonight. Uh, so a lot of the things that we obsess about often don't even come to pass. But some things do, and it's just enough of those things that do that cause us to doubt and worry about everything. We worry about our money, about our family, about our health, our job, our success, our reputation. And when these things might be affected, but what happens to me in the future, that can be a very concerning thing. What if I don't have enough money? What if my family falls apart? What if my kids walk away from the Lord? What if my spouse doesn't come back? What if my health, what if that cancer really is growing? What if my job goes away? What if my success isn't there? What if I fail at something? What if my reputation suffers? The what if, gives us great concern. And it isn't that we as Christians should move through life with no concern, unaffected by the things of our, of our lives, kind of moving through like we're floating through life, and, well, this could happen, this could happen, it doesn't matter at all. No, that's contrary to the way God created us. God created us to have love for people, to have love for things. We are to care about things in life. We are not to go through life completely detached that's not how God made us to be. That emotionally checked out attitude does not make us, or does not match how God made us as passionate people commanded to love others. However, the problem is not when we have concern about what might happen. The problem is when my concern doesn't lead to awareness and biblical action, but to obsession and total inaction. The problem is when my concern about what could happen 
turns from uh, an awareness and biblical action response to an obsession with what might happen and a total inaction. I don't know about you, but I tend to, when I'm overwhelmed with worry, want to check out. Because I'm so afraid of what will happen, I don't even know where to start that I just completely check out, I want to, and that's where I tend to get myself in trouble is when I'm trying to avoid what I'm supposed to be doing because I don't want to face what might happen. The problem is when my concern doesn't lead to awareness and biblical action, but to obsession and total inaction. And Jesus responds to this. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is in the middle of his uh, Sermon on the Mount. He's talked about the Beatitudes. And now we get into Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, in which he says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who among you, being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So Jesus gives us this uh, attitude adjustment, and he says, don't worry. Now, personally, I don't know I look at this text, and I go, that's really easy for you to say, Jesus. <laughs> You're omniscient. You can make stones turn into bread. But it's easy for you to say, don't worry. You're God. But Jesus' whole point is, yes, I am God, and I'm telling you not to worry. Because I am God, and I love you. Yes, Jesus is God, and Jesus can do all these things. It's easy for him to say we reason, but that's the whole point. Jesus is going, and I'm telling you as God, I care for you far more than I care for birds or for flowers. So why are you worried? And then he says, verse 31, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, in other words, the non-Jews, Eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. What does he mean the Gentiles eagerly seek these things? They do so without dependence upon God. He goes, you, depend on your Father. The Gentiles don't do that. They run and they seek these things. They live their lives to get these things. Don't be like them. Why? Because these people do not depend upon God to meet their needs. In other words, worry is practical atheism. Worry is practical atheism. Why? Because it acts as if God isn't there, doesn't care, or can't help us. Worry is practical atheism because it acts like God isn't there, doesn't care, or can't help. Either I show that I don't really believe there's a God in heaven who is watching and caring for me, or I really don't believe that he cares. I think he's there, but, you know, he's busy. He has a lot going on in his life. Surely he doesn't really care about this thing I'm going through. Or, yeah, he cares and he's there, but I really don't think he can do this. And so we worry. We worry because we don't think there's a God to trust. We worry because we don't think there's a God we can trust. Worry is practical atheism because it acts as if God isn't there or doesn't. But what does Jesus say to us? He says, number one, if we're going to fight worry in our lives, if we're going to give God the honor that is due him, if we're going to be consistent with what we believe as Christians, we need to battle worry. Again, there's a difference between concern and worry. Concern is being aware of what's coming and what might happen, and then engaging in biblical action. Worry is obsessing over what might happen, and then not doing what God has called you to do as a result. How do we fight worry? And the first thing Jesus tells us to do is rehearse God's power and character. Rehearse God's power and character. Notice what he says over and over. 
Verse 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. God is able to feed the birds, all of them. He says, are you not worth much more than they? Verse 28, why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say that not even Solomon in all his glory clothes himself like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? What is Jesus doing? He's connecting the very existence of these birds and flowers with God. And his whole argument is, if the God who made these birds and flowers and cares for them loves you, then what do you have to worry about? He's powerful. But then, again, his character. This God is, in, is not indifferent towards us. This God that did these things says, you're worth more to me than that. It's not just this idea that, well, there's uh, three things on God's to-do list today. Okay, I've got to wake up, I've got to feed the birds, I've got to clothe the flowers, and I've got to take care of Jariah. It's not like these things are equal playing field things. He's, his whole point is you're made in the image of God. Are you not worth much more than these? Why are you spending your time worrying? We see numerous promises throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, we find be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. We find in Job chapter 42, verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. We find in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we often call it the great what? The great commission. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. His whole point is, I have the authority as the resurrected Son of God. Therefore, you should go and make disciples. And lo, I am what? With you even to the end of the age. We find in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and unfathomable his ways. For, and then he quotes the Old Testament, Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, that he might be pay, it might be paid back to him again? For from him, and through him, and to him are most things. Oh. oh, I guess it does say that, doesn't it? Are some things. No. Are a, a, a couple of things, one or two, a few things. No, what does it say? For from him and through him and to him are all things. The very thing that I'm worried about is from him, through him, and to him. The very thing that I'm concerned about is from him, through him, and to him. How does Paul respond? To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who what? Who loved me and gave himself up for me. This same God that for him, through him, and to him are all things, loves me and gave himself for me. In the midst of my worry, I forget that I serve the God who created all things, who spoke atoms into existence. I forget that I serve the God who knows all things, sees all things, understands all things, and loves me. <coughs> Tim Keller has said, we don't know why suffering happens sometimes, but the cross says that it isn't because God doesn't love us. I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through, and I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I've given up a long time ago trying to find one-to-one -one correlations of, well, this happened because of this. Oh, well, this happened because of this. As one author said, God is doing 10,000 things 
through your situations, and you might only know three of them. But yet, in the midst of it, I know the God who is bringing these things into my life. I know his power, and I know his character. And if I build my life on my fears, I will never be able to move forward in what God has called me to do. I will never have joy. I will never have peace because there's always something that could come that I don't know. But there's nothing that comes that God doesn't know. There is nothing that comes into my life that didn't first pass before his throne if he said yes. So I ought to build my life on the solid ground of God's nature and character rather than on the shifting sand of my circumstances, feelings, desires, or fears. When I build my life upon who is God and what has he said and done for me in Christ and what has he called me to do, then no matter what I'm going through, I know that it may not turn out the way I want, but it will turn out the way God has said and he loves me. I need to rehearse God's power and character. Number two, I need to check my priorities. I need to check my priorities. <laughs> Matthew 6, 26. He says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And then verse 28 through 30. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And then look at verse 31 and 32. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or drink or wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. The result of worry is that I run around my whole life thinking it's my job to get everything I need. It's my job to get everything I want. It's my job to do everything myself. And yet, what do we find in verse 33? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Is that a promise that if I seek God's will, I'm going to get everything I want in life? No. The health and prosperity preachers love to talk that way. If you sow the seed financially, then God will bless you and you'll get everything you've ever wanted out of life. Is that what that verse says? No. But it says your needs will be met. You worry about what God is calling you to do. You see, when I surrender my life and say my life isn't my own, it's God's and God will give me what I need, then I don't need to fear and worry about what might change in my life. Fear and worry are a result. So, I'm going to be very careful how I say this. But fear and worry are a result of prioritizing things as the most important in my life over what God has called me to do. I care more about having certain things than I do about being what God has called me to be and doing what God has called me to do. Look at me at Philippians chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. Paul is writing, and he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything but that with all boldness. Now, if you just stop there, Paul's going, yeah, I'm in prison for preaching the gospel. But I know I'm going to get out of this. Paul did get out of there. But he ends up in prison again. You know what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse uh, 16 through 18? At my first defense, no one supported me, may not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and all the Gentiles might hear that I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely. Now, if you just stop there again, this is the idea that because God knows your needs, he's going to get you out of any trouble. You're never going to suffer any type of long-term suffering. 
Paul and 2 Timothy 4, 18 by saying, will rescue me and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. And what does he say in Philippians chapter 1? He says, that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by what? Life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul didn't worry about his death because he had already surrendered his life. He didn't worry about his death because he had already surrendered his life. Whether I get out of jail by uh, release or whether I get out of jail by having my head chopped off, I'm free. Because my life is not my own. And worry comes when there are things in my life that I refuse to say, that's yours too, God. Do what you want with it. Worry comes when I say, God, you can have this, this, and this, but this is mine. Don't let anything happen to it. This is my money. This is my wife. This is my husband. These are my kids. These are my parents. This is my health. This is my job. This is my success. This is my reputation. God, you can have anything else, but don't let anything happen to my thing. Or as Gollum would say, the precious, right? From Lord of the Rings, okay? Uh, that, don't let anything happen to that. Paul didn't worry about his death because he had already surrendered his life. Worry comes from making a big deal out of things I wasn't created to live for. In other words, I worry most about what I have surrendered least. I worry most about what I have surrendered least. When I find myself incapacitated by worry, I know it's because there's something in my life and I'm saying, God, don't let anything happen to this. This is the most important thing to me. God, I can trust you with a lot of things, but this is mine and I can't live if this thing's not there. Why? Because what I love and how much I love it determines what I fear and how much I fear it. What I love and how much I love it determines what I fear and how much I fear. It's the reason that when my quarter in my pocket goes missing at the mall, I don't panic in the same way that if my kid goes missing at the mall, I panic. Why? Because one's more important to me than the other. What I love and how much I love it determines what I fear and how much I fear it. I don't worry about things that aren't important to me, but the things I refuse to trust God for reveal what I'm tempted to replace God with. The things I refuse to trust God for reveal what I'm tempted to replace God with. The things I'm saying, God, you've got everything else but this, this is the God I really serve. And we call that what? Idolatry. It's making someone or something more important in my priorities and in my heart than pleasing and honoring the Lord. This has been our struggle ever since the fall. Romans chapter 1 uh, maybe there's a Romans chapter 1. There is not a Romans chapter 1, and this isn't letting me go back either. Okay, well, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, uh, uh, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about them is evident to them, for God made it evident to them, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, and professing to be wise, they became fools and traded. Worship of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. In other words, instead of worshiping the creator we were made to worship, we worship the creation. And that's where worry comes from. When I elevate the creation as more important to me than pleasing and trusting the creator. When I refuse to trust God's nature and character and walk by faith, I reveal that there are things more important to me than God's plan and calling. But if I'm going to be free from captivity to worry, I must prize what God is doing in me and in my situations more than how my situations may affect the things I value. What do I love most? God or blank? And as long as the answer is blank, I will never be able to trust God when it looks like that thing is in danger. Hudson Taylor, who's a missionary to China and founder of what today is known as the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, 
gave this excellent advice. Let us give up our work, our plans, ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, our influence, all, our, our all, right into God's hand. And then, when we have given all over to him, there will be nothing left, left for us to be troubled about. Everything that I am incapacitated by with fear and worry says that there is something that I have not surrendered yet to what God would, have to, would, would want to do with it. I worry most about what I have surrendered least. But what does Jesus tell us to do again in verse 33? But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The reason I fail to give God my all is because really I think that if he give, takes my all, if I give him my all, I'm going to be left empty. I'm going to be left disappointed. But the God who's calling me to give him my all loves me. I don't know about you, I struggle with this in many ways. I especially struggle with this with my kids. Like, I'm obsessed with my kids. I love my kids more than any other earthly thing on earth. Earthly thing on earth. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the thought that God would someday call me to give up my kids is just freaks me out. But God loves my kids more than I do. Yeah, God may say, your kids are not going to do what you thought they were going to do. They may not have the life that you thought they were going to have. And having experienced the death of my daughter, to have to surrender that to God is incredible. It's overwhelming. But God loved my daughter more than I did. And God loves me, hard as it is to believe, God loves me more than I love me. And God wants what's best for me, but I let my own love of me get in the way. I worry most about what I have surrendered least. I need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I need to prioritize who is God and what has God called me to do over what I think I need and trust him. God knows. And his plan is better than yours. Because he loves you. And he sees how all the puzzles fit together. I don't always see it. I'm the type of guy who puzzles if the puzzle piece doesn't fit, I get a pair of scissors. <laughs> I'm going to make this fit. Because I don't want to spend more time going through this than I absolutely need to. God sees how it all works together. And I need to prioritize him. But then number three, I need to fulfill my responsibilities. Fulfill my responsibilities. Verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In other words, stop obsessing about what might happen and deal with what's in front of you. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Yes, I'm to make plans. Notice what this does not say. Never make plans. Notice what this does not say. Uh, uh, work towards your future. It doesn't say that. But what it does say is, you make your plans, but it's God who's going to direct your steps. And how does he do it? God works through the decisions I make today to bring about the changes and the future he has tomorrow. In other words, I'm to do what I can today because tomorrow's actions direct tomorrow's opportunities. Sorry, today's actions direct tomorrow's opportunities. God works through today to bring about tomorrow. So stop freaking out about tomorrow and do what you're called to do today. I'm not called to worry about what's going to happen five, ten years from now. I'm called to worry about what I'm doing today. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. It doesn't say don't be aware of tomorrow. Don't plan for tomorrow. Actually, Proverbs talks about, us all, about the ant all the time. It says look to the ant. And you know the parable of the ant and the grasshopper, right? Uh, the ant is, is diligent, and he uh, goes out, and he gets his food, and he prepares for winter. And all the grasshopper does is go, oh, I'm just going to worry about today. Today I got my food. Why do I? We're to be more like the ant than the grasshopper. But we also need to understand that I can't know the future. I'm simply to be prepared and do what God calls me to do today. Walter Kelly said, worry is faith in the negative. Trust in the unpleasant, assurance of disaster, and belief in defeat. 
Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. A dense fog that covers a seven city block area 100 feet deep is composed of less than one glass of water divided into 60,000 million drops. Not much is there, but it can cripple an entire city. When I don't have anything to worry about, I begin to worry about that. That's what worry is. We obsess over what might happen instead of fulfilling the responsibilities we have today. How do we respond to worry in a way that shows we're dependent on God and that we're not walking in practical atheism? Number one, when I'm tempted to worry, I rehearse in my mind, who is God, what has he said to be true, and what has he said about his relationship with me? My God knows all, sees all, can do all, and he loves me. I rehearse God's nature and character. Number two, I check my priorities. It's the reason that I'm obsessing about this is because there's something in my heart that I've not surrendered and said, God, not my will, but yours be done. I trust you. And then number three, are there things that God has called me to do today that I'm not doing because I'm obsessing about what might happen tomorrow? How can I obey God today so that I can trust him with what he's going to do in the future? Worry is incapacitating when I'm obsessed with what might happen. But we serve a God who knows tomorrow. Amen? We serve a God who controls tomorrow. Amen? We can trust Him. Your God loves you. Keep that in your heart and in your mind. Your God loves you. And Romans 8, 28 says that He's working all things together for good to us who love Him. We're called according to His purpose. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be born to the end of the Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And everything God's doing is working for my good to make me like Christ. And he used me to be an instrument in other people's lives. Rehearse God's nature and power and character in your life. Meditate on who God is and what he's called you to do. Check your priorities. What is it you've not surrendered in your life and you're obsessed with work? And number three, fulfill your responsibilities. Let's pray. Father, thank you.